Now, the Oprich Nina is the sort of um, fairly ghoulish group of uh, or, or set of arrangements, the terror state that Ivan set up in the 1560s. And there are certainly many ghoulish accounts of it uh, and, you know, stories of these men in black uniforms uh, are riding into villages wearing uh, kind of skulls and broomsticks and um, whips and killing many, many uh, enemies of the Tsar. But if I just follow Sergei Bogatarev's account of this extraordinary event, he says Muscovy's growing involvement in international affairs and the greater complexity of its social and administrative structures put increasing strain on the limited political resources of the monarchy. By the, mid, by the mid-1560s, Ivan's fears of court feuds and his failures in Western policy were added to his constant trepidation about his family. In search for security, Ivan left Moscow with his family and took up residence at Alexandrovskaya Sloboda, northeast of Moscow. Ivan, having settled there, he accused his old court of treason and the clerics of covering up for the traitors. The Tsar demanded the right to punish his enemies. He divided the territory of his realm his court and the administration into two. The Oprichnina, from Oprich, the Russian word Oprich, meaning separate, under the Tsar's personal control, and the Zemshina, from Zemlia, Zand, officially under the rule of those boyars who stayed in Moscow. And uh, Bogatorov describes the Oprichnina policy as a peculiar combination of bloody terror and acts of public reconciliation. There were numerous executions, probably over 3,000, uh, but then there were also amnesties. People were exiled, their lands were confiscated, but then... In 1566, there was an assembly of the land, a Zemsky Sobor, that talked about whether or not to continue the Livonian War. It's a kind of, almost seen by some as a kind of Western Parliament, estate representative institution, but it was certainly a form of, I guess, advice with elites. So, very complicated thing, and... As I guess I was saying in some of the introductory things, it is a very strange policy at one level, but at another level, it's not so uh, weirdly different to, I guess, Henry VIII separating himself from the established church, creating himself as the head of the church, seizing all the land of the monasteries. Uh, and uh, asserting his own con own personal control over the growing power of the administrative estate uh, of the administrative state, and as a way of tug of war with rival institutions, whether they should be aristocrats or the church. So anyhow, it's incre it's an incredibly dramatic event hard to understand and there have been a huge range of interpretations in the literature and we might get to some of that in the second episode. Anyhow, um, then in the late 1560s there's also a famous incident where Ivan subjects Metropolitan, the head of the Russian church Metropolitan Philip, to a trial and effectively has him killed in prison. And then in 1570, the infamous uh, massacre in Novgorod occurs where uh, Ivan sort of comes in with all his oprachniki and uh, massacres thousands of the citizens of Novgorod, which had some level of tradition in, of, of uh, I guess, a, a kind of a, 
a, a tradition of independent Republican democracy almost uh, in resistance to to rule from Moscow and he uh, engages in some extraordinary humiliating acts of uh, he also uh, at least in some accounts sort of takes prisoner the uh, many of the icon painters and the skomoroki who were the sort of minstrel bards or performers uh, in a Russian kind of folk tradition uh, who Ivan had uh, in his really strange cultural mix had quite a fascination with and there's a fine book by uh, I think it's Philip Zaguta about the Russian skomoroki which actually describes how uh, one or two of these captive skomoroki would remain Rush uh, Ivan's personal court performers, his personal minstrels, his personal, you know, court poets, almost, uh, for decades after 1570, even perhaps until his death. So, extraordinary uh, event is Isabella Madariaga's um, account, biography, the chapter on Novgorod is described as Armageddon. And, uh, you know, I'm probably running out of time to add too much colour and movement to all of that. But uh, but I guess maybe we'll just uh, add a little bit. And of course, part of, part of the explanation for this event may well have been there were various plots and uh, traitors in the midst who were close to the Baltic states, the, you know, um, Buania, etc., who Ivan wanted to punish and exterminate. But in Madariaga's account here, it goes, on Sunday, 8th of January, 1570, that is, uh, Ivan proceeded to the Cathedral of St. Sophia and was met on the bridge over the river Volkov by the Archbishop Pyman hitherto a loyal supporter of Ivan's, bearing aloft the cross and icons. Pandemonium now ensued. The Tsar refused to allow the Archbishop to bless him, and loudly accused all Novgorodians of treason. He alleged that they wanted to hand over his patrimony of Novgorod to Latins, to foreigners, to Sigismund Augustus, the sort of, um, I think, Polish king and Holy Roman Emperor. The nevertheless Ivan was too pious to miss the service for Epiphany and he attended the Mass before sitting down to the banquet specially prepared for him. He then in an access of fury ordered the immediate arrest of Pyman and his boyars. He called up his retainers and launched them on the plundering of the cathedral, tore the white cow from Pyman's head and had his robes removed. Accusing him of being unfit to be an archbishop, he told him he ought to be a strolling player, i.e. Skomoroki, and that he would find him a wife at the expense of the clergy then present, who were forced to hand over large sums of money. Ivan then sent for a mare, a horse, uh, and said to Pyman, Here is your bride. Bestride her and ride to Moscow where you can be enrolled among the strolling players, i.e. Skomoroki. The prelate was mounted facing backwards on the mare, a major ritual humiliation common all over Europe, his feet tied beneath her belly and driven out of the city with a ziva and bagpipes, the accoutrements of a skomorok in his hands as a further humiliation. Since these instruments were banned in Russian churches and escorted to Moscow to await trial. And then there's a whole lot of gruesome stuff about stoves and throwing people into the uh, icy river of the Volkov and all that stuff that I won't get into. But again, there's you get a sense there of Ivan's character of this extreme theatricality and and in some ways sort of kind of evil brilliance, um, but uh, to to purposes that are also kind of hard to kind of make sense of. 
Skipping forward in 1571, the Crimean Tatars come in and burn Moscow. Um, so it, Moscow is not entirely, uh, you know, secure place at this point. Uh, and in 1572, uh, Russia sort of fights back, beats the Crimean Tatars. But it's also in that year that Ivan decides perhaps his experiment with the Oprichnina has been unsuccessful. He brings the end of this reign of terror, he uh, brings this reign of terror of seven years to an end. And strangely enough, uh, in 1572 is the year of the massacre of St. Uh, Bartholomew uh, in Paris. Uh, it's also a year when the king of Poland sort of dies. And there is, in this time, this process for electing the king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, uh, a sort of like a uh, parliamentary election. The 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 uh, Polish Lithuanian aristocrats get together in an assembly and vote on who they want to have the king to be their king. And Ivan the Terrible actually makes a bid to succeed to the Polish Lithuanian crown, uh, which seemed to attract some support, but was ultimately unsuccessful. And the victor uh, in that particular election was, I think it was Henri Anjou from uh, from France, a member of the royal family, uh, Catherine de Medici's son, who ends up going to Krakow or Warsaw, uh, finds he doesn't like it, and uh, sort of runs away within the year, causing something of a problem. Then in 1575-76, there is a very strange episode in the history of Ivan where, again, he sort of abdicates for a while and puts in his place one of the Tatar, uh, um, sort of Crimean Tatar, Central Asian Tatar princes who uh, were quite prominent in Ivan's court, Simeon Bikbulatovich, who... He makes Tsar for a while, and he claims to, uh, and he sort of operates a sort of a puppet, puppet king for a while. Again, another one of these extraordinary, theatrical, um, but also hard to explain events, but also one that uh, demonstrates these complex strands in uh, Ivan's life, including the, the roles of various Tatar princes and the influence of Mongol political traditions. Uh, then through the uh, late 1570s and early 1580s, um, there are various efforts to negotiate a peace uh, in the long, long Livonian War. And at this point, the, king, the ultimate king of Poland, Lithuania, uh, Ivan's principal antagonist in this long war, is a man called Stepan Batory, who is initially the king of Hungary, and it then uh, becomes, with his election to the Polish-Lithuanian crown, also the king of Hungary, Polish, Lithuania. So this is one of the great moments, I guess, in uh, political integration in that part of the world. He, he has quite a few military successes against Ivan and ultimately brings him to a peace agreement, which is negotiated by our friend who started the show, Antonio Polsavino. And in uh, Posavino's account of his diplomatic mission to Moscow, he says this, thousands upon thousands, including members of the nobility, have been slain in the innumerable wars. The Tatars make incessant raids into Muscovy. In one of them, 12 years ago, the capital was burned to the ground. King Stepan, as in King Stepan Pathory of Hungary, Poland, Lithuania, 
has won an unbroken string of victories during the past three years. Under the circumstances, people have every right to assume that the prince's resources are not so much reduced, by the prince he means Tsar Ivan, uh, not so much reduced as almost totally exhausted. It is general knowledge that one can travel 300 miles in any direction in his kingdom without seeing a single person. Villages still stand, but no one lives in them. The fields are universally deserted, but the forest growth over them is fresh. This is proof that the population which previously inhabited the region was substantial. And then uh, also in late 1581 is when Ivan the Terrible uh, kills his son. And I, I think I referred to this in the previous uh, episode on the Time of Troubles. And there are various accounts, I guess, of this uh, event. Some say it was intentional, some say it was a fit of rage related somehow to the state of undress of Ivan's son's wife. Uh, some say it was an accident in a brawl. Uh, we can't really know, but in any case, Ivan is utterly, utterly devastated by uh, the death of his son uh, and perhaps guilt at his rash action, whether accident or intentional or uh, crime of passion. And uh, he does, again, these remarkable, uh, inexplicable things. He, he begins to, uh, he, he sort of expresses wild grief. So there's various accounts of him sort of roaming the palaces of the Kremlin or Alexander Slobodova and, uh, you know, sort of wailing and pulling, you know, sort of scratching the walls. But he also begins to make repentance, if you like, by uh, making lists of all the people he had killed in his life and depositing these as acts of contrition in various churches uh, in Russia. These uh, lists are known as synokdiki in Russian. Again, some... Uh, historians describe this as like some sort of cynical process of ensuring the dynasty. But one really does uh, have to wonder about the very complicated um, theatrical management of mind that created this. Because there was no doubt that I was an educated and um, in so many ways sophisticated person uh, with these sort of profound religious beliefs, but also deep, deep demons. At some point he was writing songs and uh, about the idea of him being a dread angel who was delivering judgment on the world. Uh, and perhaps at this la in these last years of, the li of his life, he seems very much devastated man whose sort of uh, military ambitions have in some respects failed, whose dynastic integrity he himself has uh, wounded and whose uh, country he has devastated through too many years of war and yet who also has some extraordinary achievements. Uh, to his end, one of which is in these final years, in 1582, he, is, he supports the various uh, adventures of a man called Ermak, which lead to the defeat of the Siberian Khan, and then therefore the start of the establishment of political control, political administrative control of Siberia and the enormous uh, access to all sorts of resources, uh, including furs, of course, uh, of Siberia as part of the Russian Empire. In 1584, that is when Ivan dies, and 
his death just as his life is uh, enigmatic. And if I just read from uh, uh, Isabella de Mandariaga's wonderful biography of Ivan the Terrible, which is my preferred biography of uh, him, because it is that balanced and empathetic uh, understanding, which nonetheless does not forgive him for his his terrible, uh, terrible uh, actions. Um, uh, but he, she writes there that it's just one eyewitness account of Ivan's the death. Ivan's death, and that is by a man called Jerome Horsey, who was a British merchant. And this is another aspect of Ivan's reign, because there was various uh, English merchants who were establishing themselves in uh, Russia at this point to sort of make the most of the extraordinary trade and resources in uh, Russia's possession. And she carries on with the last day of his death. On the day of his death, Ivan was carried as usual in his chair to his treasury chamber, called for precious stones and jewels to be brought, and proceeded to lecture those about him on their properties and virtues, taking coral and turquoise stones on his hand and arm. Ivan declared, according to Horsey, I am poisoned with disease. You see, they show their virtue, but a change of their pure colour into Paul declares my death. Turquoises were supposed to change colour in the presence of poison, you see. In the afternoon, Ivan looked over his will, ordered his physician and his apothecary to attend him to the bath, and then sent for a report from his witches. Yes, that's right. Uh, Ivan was uh, quite fond of witches and sorcerers and alchemists and all sorts of non-traditional practices. Sent for his witches because the day foretold for his death was coming to an end. But he was warned that there was still time, for the day only ended when the sun went down. In the afternoon he went to the bath, solaced himself, and made merry with pleasant songs, as he used to do. He then went to bed, well refreshed, in his loose gown, shirt, and linen hose, and sent for a chessboard. Bogdan Belsky and Boris Godunov whose names you might remember from uh, last week's episode on the Time of Troubles, and if you haven't listened to that, do check it out. Uh, the two leading rival boyers in, or, you know, principal advisors in in um, Ivan's court, stood by the bed. Bogdan Belsky and Boris Godunov stood by the bed. Suddenly... Ivan fainted and fell back. The apothecary sent for marigold and rose water, for the physicians and for Ivan's confessor. And then Horsey wrote this strange, strange sentence. In the mean, he was strangled and stark dead, writes Horsey and added that an attempt to save him was made to still the outcry. But it was too late. Horsey does not uh, mention any effort to tonsure Ivan as a monk at the time, and he died without the last rites. But his confessor did hurry in to clothe him afterwards in the angel's form under the name of Iona, or brother Jonas in uh, anglicised form. So that is the death of a remarkable person and just like the mystery around false Dimitri, there is just something of a mystery around the death of Ivan the Terrible. Was he poisoned? Was it, did he die of natural causes? What exactly did Jerome Halsey mean by strangled and stark dead? Was there someone in his uh, court 
maybe one of those captive Skomoroki who might have strangled him to death. We will never know. We can only imagine some parts of history are really only there for us to try to imagine. So I hope that uh, narrative account of Ivan the Terrible's extraordinary life uh, gives you both some flavour for the enigma and the fascination, uh, but also the reality, the achievements, the terror, the horror, the violence, uh, and the uh, nature of Ivan as not necessarily an evil monster, but a, a flawed, probably in some ways, personality disordered individual who was struggling with uh, the uh, integration of uh, a, a, a state, uh, a, the, the defining of a form of rule of an empire yeah, with uh, enormous international and internal social and political tensions that was not so wildly different to other uh, Renaissance princes. Um, he certainly was perhaps on the extreme end of the violence and perhaps uh, on the extreme end of the uh, personality spectrum, but his, his uh, attempts to create a form of viable, powerful, centralised state uh, and secure the, um, the future of his dynasty, uh, despite all his erratic actions, was ultimately uh, successful. Uh, and uh, hence we have the extraordinary enigma of Ivan the Terrible and the reason he is so central to both the black legend of Russian history, but perhaps even more so than that, how he is almost like a symbol of power itself. Strange, sometimes violent, sometimes creative, sometimes theatrical, sometimes constructive, but uh, something also that almost destroys the individual who, uh, who, 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 who makes use of power.